Hello and welcome to the Haughty Culturalists. I'm Stephen Ryan. And I am Matthew Lucas. And we do post a video every week on a Friday. So if you want to follow our continuing adventures, do hit subscribe and you will know what we're doing next week. Yes. But this week, Stephen. We are back at Conifer Garden Nursery in the Dandenong. So those of you who follow us regularly will have seen this place before, but we're going to look at it from a slightly different angle. And what's that angle? Well, we're going to look at conifers and how to use them in a garden setting because yes, yes. this property has a really good collection of well-grown conifers and we're also going to talk about some of the do's, don'ts and things to watch out for. Excellent. Now, if you have a question about doing and doting, you should leave it in the comments below because every Monday we do a short and Stephen will answer your question in 60 seconds. At least I'll do my best. Tell him where you are though in the world, it does help. Yes, context is all. But now we are surrounded by beautiful mature conifers. Let's go in and start looking at these gardens here because they are fantastic. Yes, let's do that. So what is the sort of the history of the use of conifers? When do they really start getting used in garden design and planting? Well, certainly in Australia, they were very popular back in the 40s, 50s and earlier. They went out of fashion a wee bit when the Australian native push happened in the 1960s. Yeah. And they've sort of gone in and out of fashion, but never really been seriously fashionable ever since. So it's more a niche market nowadays than it mm. once was. So conifers are slowly finding new places to be in the garden. Yeah. But um, they're not probably the same as what they would have been 40, 50 years ago. Or even in the Victorian period. Because well, back I'm... then, it was before my time, <laughs> um, back then, of course, they were very popular because mm. uh, in England particularly, where the vast majority of plants were deciduous, conifers and other evergreens were seen as integral for a, for a garden because yeah. they gave structure and foliage and form and interest right through the winter months. Yes. And talking of fashion, though, just behind you... Yes. You the there we can see... Uh, a cloud pruned conifer. Yeah. So in terms of things being fashionable now, I guess the smallness of people's gardens, often in urban environments, mm. a lot of conifers lend themselves to that. And then this kind of pruning where you can control the size of the form of the plant. Yes, exactly. So these things are sort of coming back into their own again. Mm. And we're finding too that people have moved away from that sort of chocolate boxy type gardening where everything had to be masses of flowers. Yeah. And I think people are starting to appreciate a bit better subtleties of texture, form, shape, colour in foliage yeah. and know that they're going to get value 12 months of the year out of these sorts of plants. Yeah. Whereas some of the things that they would plant perhaps for flowering colour Mm. they'll get a month, two months out of it, and then it's just a green blob the rest of the year. A green blob. Okay, well, let's go and look at some specific things you need to think about when gardening with conifers. All right, let's do that. All right, Stephen, so I guess the million-dollar question, this to me looks very established. Yep. How old is this part of the conifer garden? All right, well, I believe that this was planted back in the 1970s Ooh, or thereabouts. Okay. So, so quite old now. And of course, when these were planted, they, it was a display garden and still is, mm. so that people could see what some of these plants look like that yeah. they might then want to go on and buy from the as young stock from the nursery. Yeah. Uh, but of course, that's an awfully long time back. And although it these is. are all dwarves, supposedly, okay, yeah, they have grown to quite a substantial size. And it has... I guess, created some interesting um, quandaries. Well, firstly, two things. Dwarves, we have made a film in this nursery before about dwarf conifers, yep. so we'll link that. But these look really quite big. Yeah. This looks like a tree to me, not a dwarf version of a tree. And that's only because it's, you know, 40 or 50 years old. So, mm. I mean, all these things are in... Um, relative. Yeah, it is very relative. I mean, these plants would have stayed quite small for... Mm generally the life of the average gardener so you know so you've got to look at it from that perspective now so there's two questions for me immediately firstly this border is a hundred percent conifers yeah so i mean that's great and it looks interesting but you know would you do that the second thing is you mentioned that it's taken 40 years to get this rich and full yeah when you're if you wanted to achieve this you'd have to fill in the gaps with perennials or how would yeah. you go about managing the scale of the plant when it starts really small and can take 20 years to get a little bit smaller. All right, yes, well, you've, you've got to, um, well, you've got to take the long uh, play or you've mm. got to take the short play. So mm. you plant things too close together and then you start removing things as things grow. Uh -huh. So this 
this bed, for instance, sake, might well have had a lot of other conifers in it when it was first planted. Mm. But as time's gone on, if you selectively remove conifers before they start growing into each other, mm. then they will just keep adding sort of volume and taking up the space. Yeah. So you would overplant, or you have to take the much longer view and plant the conifers so that when they're fully grown, mm. they're all going to have their individual space. Mm. But in the meantime, you have expendable, quicker growing, mm. but not too invasive of things growing with them mm. to sort of fill out the gaps in the meantime. So you've got to look at it either way. And I think the other thing for me, just looking, scanning at this, is the huge variety of what looks like, you know, the texture yeah. and the colour and the form. So maybe we should just go and look closely at some of them just to show how you can use these plants sculpturally. Yeah, what a good idea. Okay. Okay, well, the first one, which is right behind us, but I love the twisted form of this one. So what is this? Well, this is one of the forms of the Hickon Cypress, mm -hmm. so Camisipris obtusa. Mm -hmm. uh, there's multitudes of selections of it, uh, from tiny wee little miniature ones, which we did actually feature on our previous video, yeah. right up to substantial sort of large shrubs verging on small trees. Yes. And they nearly always have this characteristic sort of ferny sort of effect to the way the branches sit and a little kink to each branch. So mm. there's a great deal of interesting textural quality in this particular group of conifers. So something like this, I mean, it could stand alone yeah. in a lawn or whatever, but it's also a good backdrop, would it not be, for other planting? Oh yeah, it? yeah. In fact, conifers can often be used as front ranking things, or they can be as a background plant to sort of give body and depth to a border. Yeah. And certainly something like this, once it gets to a decent size, uh, would in fact make a very good background plant, but it's not something I would plant to hide myself from the neighbors. <laughs> it would take far too long. <laughs> All right, there's another different texture completely right next door. Let's go and have a look at that. All right, let's. And with the brilliance of technology, if we're just going to walk. Yes. So firstly, we had that. Yes, the very, Hickon Cypress. Specific, and then right next to it, we have what just looks so fern-like and soft. Yep. Which one is this? Well, this is one of the North American uh, Lawson Cypresses, mm -hmm. uh, Camisipris Lawsoniana. I think this is a cultivar called Tamarisifolia. I'm not dead sure, but mm. it grows like a bird's nest when it's young. So you get this sort of nesty-like effect with it. Yeah. And again, you know, this is a 40-year-old tree. Mm. So it is comparatively small when you consider that the wild form of it in 40 years would be a substantial lawn specimen tree by now. So I guess the thing for me is the softness that this looks so soft yes. i mean it is quite soft actually whereas often i mean a lot of a lot of pines are very spiky and look yeah. very different and yeah. so have a much more I guess, abrasive texture in the garden, whereas this is just gorgeous. Yeah, the most beautiful sort of soft, slightly droopy tips to the branches. Mm. It has great character and form. Yeah. Um, and it sort of uh, blends in with all of the other conifer shapes, forms and textures around it. Yeah. And it's a nice sort of mid rich green. So yeah. it's not the dark blacky green of some. Yeah. It's got that sort of nice mid green and it stands out superbly. Well, talking of colours then, just over here is something that is blue-green. Let's see if we can walk yeah, and talk. Yeah, let's look, walk and talk at the same so time. Yes. And again, you're telling me, and there is the tree, viewers, you're telling me that is a dwarf. Well, yeah, remember it's 40 years old. So when you look at it, it's one of the abies and it's one of the compact forms. So it's a really beautiful blue and it's a needle conifer. So the abies are... The abies, the cedars, the firs, the spruces all have needly type foliage yeah. and many of them have in fact uh, thrown semi-dwarf to dwarf varieties uh, yeah. from seed or from witches brooms which we discussed once before as witches well. Witches brooms and we're not maligning witches but that <laughs> is the name that it's given. That was a fascinating subplot. So where are these all from? I mean well, everything we've looked at here is Northern Hemisphere. Yeah. The Hikon Cypress, the first one, is uh, a form of one of the Japanese ones. Mm. The Lawson is a North American one. I think this is one of the North American firs as well. Mm. So they're all obviously Northern Hemisphere plants, but from Asia and North America, respectively. And we have native conifers. So what about the Southern Hemisphere? Is it yeah. as well represented in the Southern Hemisphere? No, no, we don't have anywhere near the number, particularly when we're talking about smaller growing conifers. Mm. Uh, we do have a range of very interesting large conifers, mm. our oricarias, uh, our hewan pines, our woolamai pine, you know, all those things which grow into quite substantial trees. But we do have one or two smallish growing conifers. Uh-huh. Well. 
And we will link our special about New Caledonian, one of your passions, yes. New Caledonian conifers. Interesting, isn't it? Yeah. So, yeah. So you've got to remember that the Northern Hemisphere conifers have been grown in cultivation by Western civilization for several hundred years now, in many cases. Mm -hmm. So they've had lots and lots of time to throw up unusual dwarf forms, different colored forms and what mm -hmm. have you. The Australian selection of conifers, or even the Southern Hemisphere one for that matter, hasn't been in cultivation as much. Yeah. Some of them aren't quite as hardy to the really cold parts of Northern Hemisphere. Mm. So therefore possibly aren't being grown in a wider area. And so they haven't had the same amount of time mm. to throw up interesting and diverse forms that some of the Northern Hemisphere conifers have, have done. So in time they could though, there could be some weird variants that emerge in, in our part of the world. very possible. I mean, when you think about it, uh, although it's only peripherally a conifer, but ginkgo biloba, uh, the maiden hair tree, which- a conifer? Well, it's it's a conifer relative. It's in a slightly different group, but it's close closer to conifers than anything else, believe yeah. it or not. Mm. Now that was one species found in the wild. They all look much the same. They brought it into cultivation. Now we've got pencil ones, dwarf ones, variegated ones, and weeping ones. And who knows what else will throw from seed from ginkgo uh, because they're raising it from seed all the time and have mm. done so for the last couple of hundred years. Mm. So some of our Australian native conifers could well do similar things given enough time. We have to come back in a couple of hundred years. years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I want to talk a bit about colour now. I mean, we've looked at this. Now, this is consistently this colour all yeah. year. Yeah, all year round. But yeah. there are many that aren't, that mm. change. Oh, yes. Should we go and look at some of those? Yeah, why not indeed? Oh, it's cold, Stephen. When you were filming Gardening Australia, did you have to pretend it wasn't winter? Uh, yeah, occasionally. And it wasn't that easy to do because sometimes you had to leave your jacket off to pretend it was midsummer. So there you go. Well, we're not <laughs> pretending. It no. is freezing and it's winter, which is a nice segue to colour. Now, yeah. this leaps out at me because it is the most vibrant gold. Yes, it's a wonderful little dwarf pine. Now, is this the new growth that is a colour or no. what's the story here? No, it's, it's the needles change colour with the season. So the same needle will go from gold in the winter. And this is funnily enough called winter gold, uh, this particular form of uh, Pinus mugo. Mm. And in the summer, this plant will be green. So the whole plant will turn back to green. So that needle changes colour for its entire lifetime, yeah. which could be years, they stay on the, well, on the plant. Well, most conifers will hold needles for at least two to three years. Wow. So those needles will keep going backwards and forwards from green to gold uh, as the seasons change. Metamorphosis. Yeah, so there you go. Now, there are other ones though that you would perhaps choose because their new growth is a particular yeah. colour. Yeah, some conifers will have new growth that's quite pale compared to the older growth so yeah. it gives you that seasonal change i mean pines are fantastic because when their new growth comes up mm. it sits like candles without the needles to start with so yes. it has a completely different look in the spring when you plant a, a true pine yeah. because of all the little candles and they can be creamy silvery white or they can be bronzy browny mm. coppery so the needles uh, or the new shoots can be quite a different colour to the rest of the plant. Mm, you so. can see here the lovely sort of silvery white candles coming up mm -hmm. and uh, that adds hugely to the plant in the spring. Uh, this is Pinus thumbergii uh, Kyoto Nishiki. Mm. So it gives you that other added bonus of, uh, of change of season. People think of conifers as being very static, static. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. they're not really. I mean, some are, mm. but the you know, vast majority of conifers do have albeit sometimes subtle, seasonal change. So you could think of them as you'd think autumn foliage in some things or yeah. spring flowers in another. They're kind of going to do the same thing. Yeah. And this is striking. And I guess, I mean, this is a dwarf one. Obviously, you can get magnificently huge trees. Yes, of course you can. But in a smaller garden, you could definitely use these in, in a perennial border yeah. or in any other part of the garden, yep. which is a mix of different plant types. And I do have to say, I get quite, well, I don't get annoyed, but I get a little frustrated sometimes when people say, oh, I don't want to plant conifers because they don't have flowers. Mm. But then they'll plant a silver birch tree, which doesn't have flowers of any merit. Nor the so, palm trees. Mainly yeah, some palm trees do have flowers. Yeah, yeah, well, let's not go down that little okay. rabbit hole. But there's certainly lots of plants we put in that are not grown for their flowers. Mm. And yet conifers are blamed for not having flowers that you can see. You don't have flowers. And some of them have beautiful cones. And that's something people forget. Mm. Uh, cones can be a very attractive feature on some of the conifers. And many of the dwarf forms still produce cones, albeit very few of them actually have fertile seed in them. Right. They tend to be sterile. But the cones can look very attractive on the plant.
So here we have it. Pinus culteri, the big cone pine, funnily enough. Okay, now there's just one more spot I want to go and look at, just to demonstrate to people again, the variety of forms and how you can use them sculpturally in the garden, because it's so beautiful. Yes, let's go and have a look at that. Now, as you come down this staircase, here is this beautiful weeping specimen, which just goes to show, Stephen, there is a conifer for everyone, for every position. Well, exactly. It doesn't matter whether you've got a big garden, a small garden, uh, almost no garden because you can grow them perfectly well in tubs, many of them. You can bonsai them, you can have a huge specimen tree. Don't look like that. Not a fan of bonsai, uh, but we will do a bonsai story. Yes, we will. And my mind. there are conifers for every style of gardening. So whether you're doing an Australian native style garden, a Japanese garden, a formal French parterre garden, mm. there are conifers that will fit into pretty well every sort of garden you could want. Mm. And from some of the largest trees in the world yes. to some really quite small dwarf specimens that will grow very happily in tubs their whole life. Yeah, yeah. In fact, there's naturally some conifers that grow virtually flat across the ground in nature. So yeah. it's not all about selections or manipulated forms as well. Yeah. And I love the fact that you can get ground cover ones, you can get a weeping one like this, you can get conifers that change their colour, that give you winter foliage-ish. Mm -hmm. It's quite amazing. And also I think for the modern gardener who might not have that much space, a lot of these will work in courtyards or tub specimens, on balconies, on terraces, yep. if you don't have acreage to grow magnificent great cedars. Yes, exactly. So have a go at some. All right, well, one of the long-term issues with conifers yes. is, of course, that because... They grow up. Yes, they do grow up. And because they're sold as dwarfs, they often are uh, assumed to stay quite small. So and this is the thing, that I am a little... I'm not struggling, but to me, if you're buying a dwarf plant, it's always going to stay small. I mean, and I get it from a, like a botanical perspective, but... These are just really big plants, yeah, Stephen. Yeah. But they're really old plants, and that's the thing you've got to keep reminding yourself. Yes. So, as I think I mentioned earlier, you then have to make decisions on whether you overplant and then remove mm. as things grow. So mm. as things start to push on each other, you then take them out. And that principle would be the same with anything, whether it was conifers or whether it was well, shrubs or perennials? To an extent, except that, of course, most other shrubs and trees and things can be pruned quite hard and started off again, mm. whereas if you cut most conifers back to a stump, mm. they'll just die. Mm. So there is that sort of more, uh, well, a stronger imperative to make a decision at one point or another, yeah. and it's generally better to make that decision before things get too out of hand. We'll get to pruning, but mm. what about this? So this is the pathway to the house. What is the issue here? All right, well, that little dwarf spruce over here, mm -hmm. which is a dwarf form of one of the North American spruces, was obviously planted as a wee little thing, not terribly far back off the path. Mm. In the case of the nursery here, they probably need the plant for propagating material and so forth, mm. so they're prepared to keep it. Mm. But if it were in my garden, because it's had to be trimmed back off the path, it's basically ruined its form and shape. Yeah. So for me, it would be something that I would consider removal. Right. Whereas this pine on this side... And I'm going to very cleverly mm. tilt the camera also would have easily grown far too big for this spot, yeah. but it's been cloud pruned to keep it in order so yeah. that um, it is actually quite in keeping with the spot it's at and it's looking really handsome in its own right. So cloud pruning, I think, is becoming quite generally fashionable and it though originated in China and Japan. Yeah. And I guess conifers have been used in traditional Japanese and Chinese gardens oh, for millennia. Yes, exactly. Yes. In very sculptural forms often. Oh, yeah, because what they're trying to do is create a small version of the wild. Yeah. So they want something that looks like an ancient big old tree, mm. but they have to keep it down to a certain size to fit into the scale of the garden. We touched on cloud pruning in our previous video, mm. but this is a really beautiful specimen. So let's just come and have a closer look and you can talk us through cloud pruning and when, why, how, yeah. etc. All right, well, let's see what we can do. Okay, Stephen, a novice's guide to cloud pruning. All right. When should you start? Can you use mature plants? Are only some things cloud prunable? All right, well, yes, no, yes, no. <laughs> uh, no, I'll, done. Yes, easy. Pines are a, a particular case yeah. because pines only grow once a year. So they send mm. up their new shoots in the spring. Yeah. These ones are just starting to send up their little candles now. Yeah. So because they only grow once a year, you only have to nip the tips out of them once a year. Okay, so let's pause there with nipping the tips. That sounds very simple, but 
um, in this in this example here, yeah. would you nip every growth point? Uh, well, it depends on how what shape you want your cloud to be. Right. So you can, in fact, break out the tips of pretty well all of the major ones, and that mm. then just makes it move sideways because mm. then you'll have three or four side shoots, but not a central one. Mm. Or you can break half the shoot off and allow some of it to produce needles. So that will increase the size of the plant slightly. Uh, with your junipers and other things, you go over the head shears. Uh, but with these, you don't want to cut through the needles. So you just go through and break the tips out. Now, why are junipers different? Because junipers have an onward growing growth pattern throughout the season. Oh, not, they don't grow, they don't have one spurt. No, they tend to grow right through that spring and summer period. So you might have to trim them two or three times. Pines only send up the one set of growth. Ah, right. So in principle then, junipers would make better hedges. Yes, they'd probably make better hedges and they're probably quicker to create a cloud pruned plant, but not necessarily long term as valuable as a pine can be, because mm. once you've got the pine shaped up the way you want it, mm. you only really have to tamper with it once a year. So in this case, do you think this was cloud pruned from the word go? When would you begin to no, cloud this, prune it? This would definitely have been let grow till it got to a stage where it was almost too big. Ah. Then the whole center of the plant would have been taken out ah, right. and then the cloud pruning starts on the tops. Oh, okay. So you can hoe into something that could be 20 years old. Oh, easily, old. but you've got to remember you'll have no regrowth from down in the bottom. Right. So it will, it will just be as it is. Okay. Good to know. My goodness, the sun is out, Stephen. <laughs> yes, how did that happen? And it's illuminating a bald patch. Yes, it is. And this actually illustrates one of the points I wanted to make. Yeah. That once conifers grow into each other, depending on which conifer it is, you can either end up with a permanent bare patch like that, mm. uh, in which case you've then got to work out whether you can plant something in it to disguise the bare patch. Yeah. Or you don't touch things at all. You just let things grow together and the bare patch is hiding amongst the other plant yeah. that's growing next to it. So the point you made earlier on too was if you're going to make a decision about taking something out or moving it, yeah. you need to do it before they start to grow into each other. Exactly. Although yeah. having said that, the conifer on the other side, this one next to you here, yeah. is Podocarpus alpinus, which is one of the Tasmanian native podocarps. Oh. And it will reshoot from old wood. So although it's been hacked back yeah. to get it out of the way, there was some other bush in the middle here that has been removed. Yeah. Um, so it's been chopped back a bit, so it looks a bit chunky and, and weird at the moment. Mm. Given six to 12 months, and it will all sort of start to grow out again. And in fact, it may well fill the gap against this Thuya that isn't in fact going to regrow again. Interesting. Now, what is the the habit of this when it's in the wild? Is it this sort of tangled shrub? Oh, yeah. It's a, it's a, a fairly uh, high altitude conifer. Mm. So it grows up in those really cold, bleak parts of Tasmania, <laughs> which feel a bit like today. And so it's, a, it's a rugged sort of informal shrub in its natural habitat, eventually growing up probably to three or four meters tall. Mm. Um, and it will depend on where it's growing as to, in fact, how tall it will, in fact, get. So in the more exposed spots, it may well end up just being a ground cover yeah. in more sheltered places it might grow into a, a moderately sized small tree yeah which brings us to a cunning point then this is an alpine conifer from yeah. a cold damp part of australia yes. relatively cold obviously to the rest of the world what is their capacity to deal with cold and then heat so obviously yeah. they're from a vast range of different environments oh exactly and there's no sort of one rule for all conifers. Mm. For instance, say something like the podocarp isn't going to cope terribly well with really hot, dry uh, conditions in high summer. Could you grow this down in Melbourne? Yes, you can grow perfectly well in Melbourne, but you'd want to plant it somewhere where, in fact, um, it wasn't in a really hot spot and yeah. somewhere where you could irrigate a little bit right. because it doesn't like really dry soil. Yeah. All right, why are we in front of this? Oh, Ooh, right. ow. That, <laughs> yes, this slightly ones, prickly one. The other ones were so soft and ferny. This isn't. Yes, well, this is one of the um, spruces, one of the Pisces, and it illustrates another thing that people should be aware of. Yeah. There are certain conifers that are not completely stable. <laughs> a bit like, like us. The best of us. <laughs> yes. And so they'll sometimes revert to basically the wild form. Yeah. So although the plant itself is still basically intact, yeah. if you look up here, oh my goodness. there's a whole section that's come up now, and you, you can see how much coarser it is. The needles are more spaced, the branches are more spaced. 
So that's the wild form of this particular conifer. And is it just growing out of a branch yeah. at the top? Yeah. Wow. And, and this is something that will quite regularly happen with certain groups of conifers. Yes. Now, it's not the end of the world, but you do have to keep an eye out for such things because uh, if you don't remove that piece of branch there, it will eventually become a big towering tree and this will all disappear. Mm. So if you've got a reversion in a conifer, and we'll have a look at another one in a minute, you need to get in pretty well as soon as you see it. This one's been left for a little longer than I would have preferred. Uh, but when you're running a busy nursery, I can very much understand why it hasn't been dealt with. And it's at least given us something to talk about. So there you go, a reversion. So that's a bit like variegation in yep. a tree when you get a green part, you need to chop it out, blah, blah. Yep. I guess the only issue here, which you made the point earlier on, is that that has shaded a part of the tree. Yeah. So if you left it and then cut it out, you're going to have a bald patch, which isn't going to grow back. No, well, it, with something as tight as this, you could probably tie some branches in together uh, and fill the bald patch with some side branches from around it. Right. But certainly you'd be far better to get rid of that ASAP so that it doesn't in fact leave a big gap in the plant when you take it out. So let's just talk about genetics for a minute, because this, I'm. I'm sort of bemused by this. Variegation I can understand because yeah. it, the tree looks the same, it's just the leaves are different colours. Yeah. This looks like two completely different yeah. trees. Well, that just goes to show what in fact happens uh, when you get, say, an aberrant form from a witch's broom that it could easily oh. throw back to its original form. Right. Uh, or even a freak seedling that comes up which has a different shape doesn't always stay stable mm. and therefore could possibly throw back to something else. I mean, we do assume that you watch every one of our videos intensely. But just in case did. you didn't watch the last one, just explain the witch's broom. Thing. All right. Yes, witch's brooms are tight, congested pieces of growth mm. that you'll find up in a normal tree. So you might have a, a towering 60-foot pine tree uh, with this tight clump of growth in the top of the tree. Mm. There's some debate about how it happens, but it's thought to be due to some sort of virus or fungal infection that uh, has an impact on the genetics of that particular branch. Mm. And if you propagate from that little branch you'll end up potentially with a dwarf form but they're not yeah possibly such as this but they're not always completely 100 percent stable so they can sometimes throw back like that so which there you go. is what is it which, which is, is broom which is broom yes. apologies to all the witches out there but that's what it's called yeah all right well let's go and look at the next thing yep. that has crossed our path all right now this is a yew tree. Yes, it's actually a plum yew, cephalotaxis. So they're an Asian representative of the yew group. And I didn't know yews were conifers. Yeah, well, there you go. You're learning something today, Matthew. Uh, and yews have um, a couple of characteristics that are worth knowing. Yep. They're one of the conifers that you can, in fact, prune back into the old wood. Right. and they will reshoot again. Hence, they're often used in hedging. Hence, they're often used in hedging. And I just wanted to point out this one because this is a pencil form of the plum yew, yeah. Cephalotaxis uh, Harringtonia fastigiata. And it's also got some reversion in it. So there's a section of the tree that's growing in an outward direction instead of in the upward direction that the normal f or the pencil form should grow in. Mm. So again, I would definitely manage that by removing the bits that are growing out of that that in fact aren't growing in the shape that it should be. So there you go. Talking of hedges, Stephen Ryan, we are in a different part of Conifer Gardens Nursery and this hedge is massive. Goodness, yeah. it's like a castle. It is rather. Uh, and in fact, it's probably cassowell and gold, uh, which is one of the Leyland cypress forms uh, that has been grown to a substantial boundary hedge. And completely impenetrable. It's amazing. Yeah, well, no thieves will get in. The rabbits will, but others won't. And then what are these wonderful ones behind us? This looks very sort of English stately homey. Yeah, well, it is rather. David's being quite um, whimsical with his hedging over there. And that's a mixture of different Thuya varieties. Now, yeah. Thuyas in general are better as hedges than some of the Camisipruses and the Cypresses and the, uh, and all those other Leylandy types, mm. because most of those, you cut them back into old wood and they won't reshoot. The Thuyas, in fact, will often reshoot from older wood. So you can actually take them back a little bit further. Right. Uh, and so they're probably better plants as hedging, and they also don't get the cypress canker and some of the other diseases that are getting around. And how old do you think this hedge is? I would 
guess on around about the 25 to 30 years old. Oh, that's quite young and it looks massive. Yeah, oh yeah, well, if, if it is in fact what I think it is, which is Castlewell and Gold, which is mm. one of the Leyland Cypresses, they Very grow fast. like fury. <laughs> <laughs> so it's one of the issues with them. I mean, in England, they've now become sort of persona non grata or plantona non grata because they grow so fast and people have used them for screening themselves out from their neighbours. But unfortunately, they've also cut out their neighbour's sunlight and their neighbour's everything. Mm. And so there's lots of, new laws and things coming in to protect people from other people's Leyland cypresses. But here they're on a road boundary. They're not causing anybody any problems. Mm. They're giving the nursery a really good screen. Mm. They're also giving the nursery a good windbreak. And of course, because it's a conifer nursery, they're showing off what you can do with some conifers. And they're beautiful. I really love this hedge here. Yeah, the well. Thuya bit is really nice. I think it's quite whimsical and quite sweet. And it is a variety of different forms. So if you look closely, there's goldish ones oh, in yeah. there yeah. and there's sort of variegated ones in there. So there's a whole range of different Thuyas that have been sort of popped into this hedge. What a great idea. Yeah, I think it's fabulous. So Stephen, this was the bit that caught my eye. There are so many forms and colours and the way that these conifers are occupying the space. Yes, and they will never look boring because there is in fact different colours, different textures, different yeah. forms, yeah. all sort of playing off each other and making for a very attractive whole. But I think you pointed out this was planted in the 80s and 90s, yep. so it is 30, 40 years old. But if you start now, it'll give you something to live for. But I also think you've kind of just got to commit to it, haven't you? Because these are all tangling in amongst each other. As mm. you said, you can't go in and prune them and thin them out. No, they, so you, they have to live like that now. You've got to commit. Yep, exactly. <laughs> well, this has been wonderful. Thank you, Conifer Gardens, for having us. It is a fantastic place. And I have to say, viewers, that I hadn't necessarily been infused with the world of conifers, but this nursery is just something else. Everything is so mm. beautiful. Yes, it's one of those places that can turn your head quite easily mm. to this particular group of plants. Well, I might not have to leave empty-handed. No, well, we'll have to go and buy you something, shan't we? But now, if you want to see what we're going to be tempted with next week, you'll have to hit subscribe. We post every Friday. And don't forget, too, that we do our Monday shorts. So if you've got a question that you think I might be able to answer for you, post it below and tell me where you're from to give me context, and I will try and answer it in 60 seconds or less. And remember, Every plant we've mentioned in the video will be in the text below, so just hit read more if you can't see them immediately. And we look forward to seeing you yes. next week. And you. Bye all. <laughs>